Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. This morning is Sunday, March 4, 2018. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. Florence will begin with our morning prayer. Thank you. Mrs. Eddy's prayer given at the Massachusetts Metaphysical College. Oh my God, I offer as a consecrated gift upon thine altar, a heart dedicated to thy service, lips speaking only words of charity, love and truth, thoughts striving to be only the true thoughts of the mind of God. Help me to endure unto the end, strong in the faith, powerful in the truth, all the influence that I can bring to bear, all the force of tongue or pen that is mine, I offer in thy service. May heaven help, consecrate, and accept. Thank you. And miscellaneous writings, Mary Baker Eddy. We today in this classroom are enough to convert the world if we are of one mind, for then the whole world will feel the influence of this mind, as when the earth was without form, and mind spake, and form appeared. Our subject today is man. The Golden Text Psalm 40. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And then before we get too far along, last week I was going to ask Day Day. She had, she had some prayers that she had uh, sort of made up for her little children. And I'd like you to share them, Day Day. Sure. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the prayers just came to me first when I was putting my daughter to sleep one day, and it's very simple. It's just there's no worry, no doubt, no fear, just sleep. God is here, and he loves me. There's no fear, just sleep. And then a few years after, or at, about a year or so after that, when she started to go to school, we just changed it a little bit on the way, and it was the same, but the words um, just varied a little bit. No worry, no doubt, no fear, just fun. God is here, and he loves me. There's no fear, just fun. So she was able to memorize it. Um, we still say it to this day, and it's actually very helpful for me as well because, like I said, you can just change the words and make it fitting for any occasion, just to remind yourself that there's no fear. God is here, so no worry, no doubt. Thank you. We had talked recently about the importance of teaching our children and prayers. I know I gave a testimony, too. But I, I, I love this example because this is something that I have done, too, with my children and grandchildren. You, you make up things. It's, it's, it's you're singing to them or speaking to them, things that will your heart that will be appropriate. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be something you've read, but something that comes to your heart, and uh, it will come out in meeting their, their little needs for the day. And how wonderful to have that at night before they go to sleep, and then also as they go off to school. It's a great protection. And also, it gives the parent a peace of mind as as Day Day said, you almost say it for yourself as well. They're in God's loving care. And again, it's in this week's lesson about teaching our children the truth. And whether you have children or not, we teach whoever we can get our hands on. <laughs> as, only as God directs, of course, because um, if he doesn't, it would be in vain. But it says that you t thou shalt keep Therefore, his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may be well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. 
So um, Linda will also read the watching point number 118. Okay. Watch lest you forget that your primary reason for denying the beliefs of sin, sickness, and matter is that you cannot serve two masters. You must make the things of God real to yourself. The first step in this direction is to make the things of mortal mind unreal. You should not seek to get rid of them for any other reason than to make way for the reality of spirit and of spiritual existence." End quote. Thank you. It's very important to make sure that what we're doing, we're doing if we're getting rid of the error, it's to have it replaced with the truth. Because if you just try to get rid of the error, what's going to happen? A <laughs> multitude comes. That's it. That's, that's the error terrible. comes back and it brings all its cousins. Right. <laughs> that parable that Jesus gave us, yes. So, most important. And I thank Ray. Ray from Florida has been finding the watching points and Linda posting them. So thank thank you. Thank you all for all the work that you do to make our website, our services, our times together so enriching. All of you are part of it, and I'm grateful for that. So, okay, today we're going to get into, well, how obedience brings healing, and who knows the theme of this week's lesson. <laughs> it is in almost every verse. <laughs> And it's a good way to um, describe man, and we we are obedient to that mind that made us. Now, let's see. Bruce is gone. He's singing today, but he wrote some good things on the forum, but we will. Um, let's see. Jeremy, you tell us about what you wrote, being willing and obedient and rebellious. <laughs> yeah, reading it and noting all the times it mentioned both obedience and rebellion just got me thinking about how, you know, there's more than just coming here and learning that God is good and trying to be obedient just to that. There's also that call to to say no to all the all the not right and be rebellious to that. So and I just really like <laughs> I like that. I like like finding that out because for whatever reason there is that call within me to be rebellious. But now I have <laughs> I have the direction to point it towards. So. Yeah. Rebellion against God of course is very, very bad. But this is that he tells us to rise in rebellion against what? All that, is, all that is unlike good. Thank you. All that is unlike good. So in that respect, we have every right to rebel. And it's a good thing to rebel, because rebel means strong action, not to just sit by and let it happen. So. Plus, I kind of feel both things together are what keep you on the straight and narrow. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I think as Jesus' pray, her own prayers were conscientious protests of truth. That's right. And that was a beautiful a description of a prayer. Say that again. Jesus' own prayers were conscientious protests of truth. I often think that because what better thing to, to know than how Jesus prayed? Conscientious protests of truth. That's how our prayers should be. And in this lesson, it brings out so beautifully the, and fairly wrote this lesson, first Hezekiah, his obedience to the truth, um, then in Isaiah about being willing and obedient, and then the beautiful story that we covered yesterday, and thank you, Tom, you're here on the disciples and Jesus and obediently 
following Christ's command. And then in Philippians, and this is what Parthens wrote about, and this also, Carol, can be an article. His, his forum, what he writes in the forum, serves as wonderful articles. He's quoting from Henry Drummond when he says, Christ's life outwardly was one of the most troubled lives that was ever lived. Tempest and tumult, tumult and tempest, the waves breaking over it all, all the time till the worn, worn body was laid in the grave. But the inner life was a sea of glass. The great calm was always there. At any moment you might have gone to him and found rest. And even when the bloodhounds were dogging, dogging him in the streets of Jerusalem, he turned to his disciples and offered them as a last legacy, my peace. And then Carthens writes that Jesus had mastered the troubled waters of mortal mind so much that his entire being became a still, smooth, polished, reflecting surface upon which the light of God could shine undimmed and uninterrupted. One reflected beam of which was more powerful than any laser weapon devised on earth. Now, in, in the testimony given Wednesday night, it was Wendy's testimony, is she here? Yeah, and Wendy, what did you find? First you were rushing around trying to find this, these missing keys. Do you want to speak or I'll speak? Go ahead. Okay. Well, you were rushing around <laughs> trying to find the keys, and it was only when, when what did you find them? When I stopped and prayed and knew the truth that they were not lost. That's right. You became this still stillness. You were able to hear God's voice. It comes to you in stillness. This is Eddie has said we need to pray to be quiet and to be still. So remember that and remember in times of when things seem all out of whack and excitable and whatever condition that might be to maintain your peace. Just tell yourself peace. You know, in that story I told a few weeks ago about the the minister who picked up someone in Mexico and the, the hitchhiker and the hitchhiker was going to kill him and he said his first impulse was to be very much afraid and then he realized no 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 he he logically said no you're not <laughs> he knew even though he had every reason to be terrified he he centered his thought and when it brought it back to God and peace and quiet and in doing that, he was able to totally change that situation. Totally. Now, I'm going to tell you another story. And this is a story that our dear new friend, Russ, of British Columbia, sent to me. It was in a uh, newspaper article. Um, but, it, but it is quoting from A Century of Christian Science Healing. I don't know if any of you have that book, but it, it is actually a very wonderful book with a lot of tremendous healing in them. So I'll let Gary read this. It says, <clears throat> one of the most remarkable and practical accounts of, dis of disrupting this material mythology comes from Adrian Vin. Singuera, a former prisoner in a German POW camp during the Second World War. While interned, Vincent Guerra chanced upon a copy of Science and Health. While studying it, she clearly glimpsed man's spiritual identity, which changed how she thought about herself and her enemies. She realized she was spiritual and free rather than imprisoned by hate and fear. So she gathered her few belongings 
and walked out of the camp in broad daylight, past guards and dogs and watchtowers. Despite having no formal papers or identity card, she spent the rest of the war being fed and sheltered by strangers, even Nazi officials, who sometimes offered lodging and gave her food ration cards without asking questions. In her view, this protection stemmed from looking beyond the chaotic human picture and seeing God's spiritual man right where the hateful mortal version seemed to be. For a full account, see A Century of Christian Science Healing, 1967. Startling examples such as this one serve to awaken us. We don't have to wait for the world to change to find peace, nor must we be satisfied with the status quo. No matter what religious tradition we come from, If enough of us practice seeing flawed humanity through God's spiritual lens of love and humility, forgiveness and grace, we can yet transform our world. Isn't that beautiful? And of course we know Christ Jesus would pass through the crowds and sometimes people trying to wanting to kill him and he would pass through unharmed. But this is the state, when we are in that divine state of mind, when we are knowing we are the child of God and everyone else is the child of God, when we really know it without doubt or fear, this is what can happen. I mean, there's no human explanation for what. I mean, they they didn't even, she was able to go past the guards. They didn't even ask her. It was like she was invisible. And this is how we, we bring heaven on earth and also in yesterday's watch, bringing in the millennium, it is within our own consciousness. We're either seeing it or we're not seeing it. But it requires that stillness that Parthens wrote about. And the, and the really interesting aspect of this, to me anyway, is that we don't have to change anybody else. We don't have to talk anybody else into it. We don't have to prove anything to anybody else. We just have to be right with God, and God will change everything else, the appearance of everything else, as necessary. Because what did these people see as she walked by them, walking out of the prison? Must have saw a free person because if they saw a prisoner, they would have. They saw the truth. And God did that because that's all that's real in the first place. God took care of everything that needed to be taken care of. That's because his work is done and his work is perfect. She just had to open her eyes to the truth. And that's all we ever have to do. It's powerful. And if we would just do it and devote ourselves, our lives, our time, our energy, everything we have to it, it is done first in our own lives and then in the lives surrounding us and it, it's a ripple effect it goes out and that's what obedience is to me anyway I think it's also helpful for us to you know go about our day knowing that everyone else is in constant contact with God absolutely that's right. Parthens also sent me another YouTube about a woman in Turkey who was tra- training to be in ISIS and had had quite a terrible background of being beaten and other things. And um, I forget the circumstances, but anyway, she became a Christian somehow and um, was able, sort of, again, under extraordinary circumstances to get out of this situation. 
and now she has a following of six million people, mostly Muslims, who she is turning to Christianity. And to hear her speak, I mean, she's so fired up about it because, again, without going into g details, what happened in her life as a Christian, she was just, she was raised up out of just an awful situation. And because of that, she can speak about it and speak so forcibly and, and to great help of many others. So, and, and Parsons, when he sent it to me, said, well, this is the result of our watches. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, and so we must keep, keep our prayers and knowing, as, as Florence just said, everyone is in contact with the Christ, with God. And whatever our background or our experiences he is there to lift, to save, to heal, and to bless. That's obviously true because these people are finding the truth without anybody telling them. The other videos that Parsons has sent, the the people had had never heard about Christianity, never been taught it, but came to them. Came to them, yeah. They would say they had a visitation, to Christ, and why not? Why should not? Why should that seem strange to us? shouldn't because it's already in everyone. I mean, all are in one, right? That's right. And then I think, uh, is it Peter V. Ross, one of the early workers said that they always thought of their patients as Christian scientists. Everybody is a Christian scientist. So yes. this thing of sometimes we say, well, he's not a Christian scientist, so he might not understand or something. It's not really the right thought. Absolutely. And I do tell people when they tell me, oh, my husband's not a Christian scientist. Well, who says that? Who said that? He is. I mean, maybe he doesn't call himself that, but everyone has it within themselves. If, if you see them as not being that, you have created the stumbling block. You have to see them there. Mrs. Evans used to always tell us to see whatever person what. In church. In church. In church. <laughs> so everyone is, everyone has this truth in them. And that includes, you know, children that seem to be out of control. Well, if they're out of control, they're re they are rebelling against something that probably is not, hasn't been right in their life. So see them, see that truth working in them. Know it's there, because it is. Look for it, you'll find it. If you look for the other patterns, you'll find that too. No, we were given with the dough for our children and everyone that they are obedient to the mind that made them. But also, you, we, I, must be obedient to that mind. If you're not obeying it, then you sure can't shove it on other people. That is preaching without practice. What does Mrs. Eddy say? The era of the ages is preaching without practice. That's what people rebel against, and rightfully so. Okay, any comments or anything anyone wants to say before we go on? Just, I think to find some help now. All right, in um, Citation 5, Florence wrote about that. And Florence, you want to, on the forum, and also Amanda and Gary, Ray. Oh, Citation. <clears throat> it was a beautiful citation. Thanks, Fairly. It says, belief produces the results of belief. And the penalties it affixes last so long as the blind, the belief, sorry, and are inseparable from it. The remedy consists in probing the trouble to the bottom, in finding and casting out by denial the error of belief which produces a mortal disorder, never honoring erroneous belief with the title of law, nor yielding obedience to it. Truth, life, and love are the only 
legitimate and eternal demands on man, and they are spiritual lawgivers enforcing obedience through divine statutes. Oh, I just said that wake up people, we have opposite laws governing and leading us into disharmony, fear, and sickness. When our maker has given us spiritual laws that should govern us into health, holiness, love, what are we doing, especially when we have caught a glimpse of this redeeming truth? And then I said that, yeah, that's essentially it. I mean, we are obeying the wrong laws. We're having them govern us instead of the spiritual great laws that govern us into health, holiness, and love. And this, this, remember now, this is, we're going to learn today, healing. There are many ways to be healed, but this is healing through obedience, what we're talking about. This is obeying Christ's commands. People don't realize that this is what we're to do. They just skip over all of this and just think it's nice talk. It's not nice talk. You are given specific directions as to what to do if you are feeling sick or depressed, or your home life is a mess, you are under beliefs. Beliefs, the Adam dream, and you have a right to get out of it. The penalty it affixes lasts so long as the belief and are inseparable from it. Okay, so you pull the trouble to the bottom. What does that mean? It out. <clears throat> Excuse me, root it out. Get every bit of it destroyed. Okay. Well, get to the belief itself. The, yeah. Get to the belief, get to the lie itself, and face it. Mm-hmm. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Don't ignore it. But face the lie. And Cut then. Out. Then demand the truth about which the lie is the lie. So the lies that you have a sickness because of heredity problems, because of an accident you had 20 years ago, because of um, contagion, or your marriage is miserable because your husband or wife is not a Christian scientist, because they drink, because... There are a million of these reasons for our misery. But you ha- this is probing the air. And maybe it's even deeper than that. But you've got to be willing. Mrs. Eddy calls it spiritual anatomy. You, di- you do it to yourself. You dissect yourself. And you will know. if you- This is the thing about being quiet and peaceful. When you're quiet and peaceful, even if you think you don't know what the real problem is, it will come to you. Why do you rush all the time? Like avoiding it. Yes. You can't hear it or deal with it. Yes. Because it wants you to hear the truth. Yes. It keeps you running. Keeps you running. Keeps you running. You rush so you don't have to face your thoughts. Just run from the next thing to the next thing. Or you're trying to find the solution when only God knows the solution. Yes. He will reveal it to you when you're quiet. And when we're in agony, we often are impatient. We want the quick fix. Rather than being willing to persevere, suffer the agony until until it is defeated. That is what is wrong with the drugging of America. Because it is a quick fix. And, it, and it, you miss the opportunity to probe, to find out what is really bothering you. And it is always something. Or it could be nothing. <laughs> You'll find it something, and then the something will turn into a nothing. <laughs> because it is, it is ultimately It's always nothing. been a nothing. <laughs> it's always been a nothing. You have created it into a something. And then what happens when you don't handle it when it first comes as a thought... Then, it, then, then you begin to see it in other ways, in your physical body, 
or in your neighbor or in your relative. Oh, there it is again, <laughs> even worse than before. <laughs> and now it's really, really real because not only did I think it, it's right there in front of me. It's proof that it's real. And yet, you are just externalizing your own beliefs. Replace belief with the understanding of the truth. That's what Gary was saying. Then you go back. And this is why I've told people, write down what you were afraid of. Write down what, what's bothering you. And then on the uh, opposite side of the page, write the truth. What is, what's in the Bible and science and health? What does God say about this situation? And this is the replacement of the arrow with the truth. But please, slow down enough to do it. Because some people are just roaring around, accomplishing nothing. And it keeps popping up in other ways. First you'll have this problem, then you'll have another problem, pretty soon some other problem, because you refuse to face it. And the false idols of our world will promise you something that will alleviate the pain. They will, they will tempt you to buy their, you know, the, to, to buy their whatever, their drug or their services or, or whatever. And that's when you have to be willing to say, God, is this from you or is it not from you? And if it's not of God, don't go there. And you see, when you do drug yourself, and most most all of you know this, then you are missing the opportunity to find out what the real problem is and get the true healing because God is the master physician of it. He is the master physician. Now, in our church, however, if things have gone so long and you feel you need to do something, go to the doctor or even take a drug or whatever, you are free. No, there is no condemnation to do that. As we've talked about, Mrs. Eddy at times, had to resort to the use of eternal or temporary means until she could get her thought peaceful enough to work again. So that, that's all right. But first you should do everything you can before that, knowing, too, that the ultimate answer is found only in God. And as you, as you practice these steps, remember, this is obedience to God. If you don't do it, you are disobeying God, and that's why you're not coming up with the right solution. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. One of the things that we talk about the drugging, but there was also ways of drugging with the words, like, um, like mental yes. suggestion using the words over and over, which I found I, that's what I thought you were supposed to do. Well, I came here, and then you get to the point then where you can't use it, and then I'm actually very grateful I had something that made me suffer, and I couldn't just fix it easily because it made me to work and keep at it, but that's Thank one you. of the things I found out I was doing. Yeah, there's, there's the mental drug of hypnosis, Yeah. which is animal magnetism. And you can self-mesmerize yourself. And sometimes just repeating things over and over and over, even if it's the truth, can be mesmeric. Because you think, I'm doing, I'm doing the work, you know, I'm doing the work, and you're just, you're just being parroting. Yeah. yeah. For some people, that's the rosary. Yeah. <laughs> the, sp the letter without the spirit... Is what? Oh, dead. Yeah, yeah. It's almost worse than not having the letter at all. Amanda, you wrote on this on the forum. Would you like to? You mentioned the article "Choose Ye" by Mrs. Eddy. Yeah, my comment was. Um, when I hear wake up, I, I always hear it in Florence's voice now, but um, right after that, I, I just choose you, her article came um, where she, I think the quote I put up was, 
the wholly apart from this mortal dream, this illusion and delusion of sense. And Christian science comes to reveal man as God's image, his idea coexistent with him, God giving all and man having all that God gives. Um, and I, she also directs us to the, the first commandment and golden rule, which to me the first commandment is always a, a quick, it's, it's kind of to go to the basics because sometimes these things that come up, whatever they be, illness or so forth, seem really mesmerizing. I mean, I feel like I'm standing there with, you know, drooling, so eyes bugged out just staring at it. So to me, that first commandment is a good basic to go back to first to kind of provide comfort to yourself, to help with the fear. Um, But then something else that Florence has pointed out that I I didn't really, I wasn't aware of until here is the, the duty. Once you know, you have an obligation to do that. That's part of obedience. And I wasn't really familiar with the daily duties until coming here. Um, and sometimes that's that extra kick that keeps you going of you have an obligation to do this. There's a duty to this part of, part of being obedient as opposed to just um, doing it or thinking nice things to make yourself feel better in a time of crisis. Thank you very much. And th- this is the importance of actually reading our textbook, reading prose works doing our daily duties, living this truth, studying it and imbibing it so that you can you actually know what you should do. And it's not just pie in the sky. This is the obedience. And it will often take courage to be obedient, won't it? Yeah. It does. Yeah. I mean, because you've got peer pressures, you've got sometimes household members, you've got relatives, you've got people at work who are pushing you to entertain a false god. Go to the doctor, go take a drug, go do this, go do that. And you you have to be able to say no. You have to be able to shut it out. Sometimes you have to shut people out. Jesus often had to send people out of the room before he could heal somebody. Okay, Carol, read number eight. Obedience to the so-called physical laws of health has not checked sickness. Diseases have multiplied since man-made material theories took the place of spiritual truth. You say that indigestion, fatigue, sleeplessness cause distressed stomachs and aching heads. Then you consult your brain in order to remember what has hurt you, when your remedy lies in forgetting the whole thing. For matter has no sensation of its own, and the human mind is all that can produce pain. As a man thinketh, so is he. Mind is all that feels, acts, or impedes action. Ignorant of this, or shrinking from its implied responsibility, the healing effort is made on the wrong side, and thus the conscious control over the body is lost. Thank you. Now... How often do we think about our indigestion, our fatigue, our sleeplessness? <laughs> Are you thinking they about the, it? I think no, they often. take the part, the place of God in our thinking. They do. We don't watch it. The remedy relies on forgetting the whole thing. You know, and I've heard, I've heard of wonderful healings where people have said they've had Christian Science treatment, and then they do forget the whole thing, and then. Months later, they say, oh, yeah, I, I don't have that problem anymore. This is that he says in Colectani, I turn to this today, page 7, we experience a recurrence of evil and suffering because we don't forget them. <laughs> we are often deterred from undertaking things because of the remembrance of past failures. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I was hurt. That hurt me once, so it's going to hurt me again. 
I can't do this. I'm a stupid on computers. I can't do it. Won't do it. Thinking about it. Thinking about it. Thinking about it. And pretty soon, that's just what you get. You are not following the rules that we just talked about. <laughs> These are beliefs. And you're not obeying God, and because you're not obeying God, you're not working out the problem. You'll get the wrong answer. You will be a stupid idiot on the computer, and you will be sick <laughs> or whatever else you insist upon being. You get what you expect. You do. That you receive what you believe, and you will get what you expect. But the good news is that right thought must externalize itself. And sometimes you have to. You have to have a bit of a battle with yourself to stop this kind of thinking because it's been so ingrained in you. But that's all right. No one said this was a garden party. Battle, battle, or go, go ahead, battle. Good thing to do. Suzette says the warfare with oneself is grand. <laughs> and that is in the article Obedience. And that first part of it, diseases have multiplied since man-made material theories took the place of spiritual truth. Think about that. So how often are you dwelling in the spiritual truth? Make that your dwelling place. Please don't be on the computer Googling every symptom and talking about it and rehearsing it in your head. You are not obeying God. And then, oh. go ahead. No, or obeying the medical verdict. I mean, if you, we are told this and this, then they will tell you this and this and that. But what is God saying? What is the opposite truth that is from God, the only creator? Yes. No, exactly. And it's important to understand that medical diagnoses, are merely human theory. They are not science. I mean, the medical profession tries to call itself a science. Yeah. It says, oh, you know, we've got biology, we've got you know, chemistry, we've got all these sciences. Well, no. <laughs> and now, you know, with children, I, I find even my children and the doctors are, oh, and the research is this, and the new research is this. I mean, all confusing. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's human theory upon human theory. So don't buy it. Don't be impressed by it. There are good people trying to help mankind in the wrong way. Give them credit for trying, but don't be impressed at all by their diagnosis or their prognosis. Because they are matter physicians, and this is matter. <laughs> yes, they're, they're looking at matter. And I find now, usually, they, they, if they can't find out what's wrong with you, they'll say it's an allergy. Everything's an allergy. You have something wrong, and they don't know what it is, it's an allergy. And if they don't know what to do, they give you an antibiotic. I mean, I, is that not true? <laughs> I mean, I hear this yeah. a lot. So it's, it's guesswork. But that is true. Many, many good, good people are in the medical profession who are giving themselves unselfishly to help mankind. Most of those people know something very important. And what is that? That God is the healer. God. Okay. They know that God is the healer. If they're honest, they will admit that. They will admit that. And when they see miraculous healings, they will also admit that only God could have done it. And that's why Mrs. Eddy says, if you have to go to a doctor, make sure he's a Christian scientist, the kind that believes that there is a supreme being and that are less medical, not into trying to take your money and all of that. So, so and I... I love where she says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Mind is all that feels, acts, or impedes action. Ignorance of this or shrinking from its implied responsibility. The healing effort is made on the wrong side, and thus the conscious control over the body is lost. What does that mean, shrinking from its implied responsibility? 
that you better watch your thinking. Your thinking has something to do here. Be responsible. That's an implied responsibility to watch what we are thinking. Yes. Thank you. It's a discipline, isn't it? Yes. This is Eddie says, stand porter at the door of thought. She wasn't whistling Dixie. I have had people argue with me about, well, the reason I'm having this problem is because, well, because it's my monthly cycle. I always go kaflui. I, In other words, I have no control over anything. It is because it is my monthly cycle, I go kaflui. This is, this is why. And they are shrinking from the implied responsibility that they have to take control of themselves and their actions and their thoughts. It can be much easier to blame some outward circumstance. That means, phew, I'm got free over that. <laughs> I have nothing to do. I'm just a helpless victim. That's why we don't accept that anyone is a helpless victim. You are never a helpless victim. You are triumphant, a victor in God. Don't blame things on other things. That's shrinking from your responsibility. It's because my uncle was mean to me. It was because of this or that. And they will say, this is why. This is why. And that goes back to <laughs> citation seven. Self-love is more opaque than a solid body. In, patience, obedience, in patient obedience to a patient God, let us labor to dissolve with you, the universal solvent of love, the adamant of error, self-will, self-justification, and self-love, which wars against spirituality and is the law of sin and death. Now, you wrote about that, Linda, a little bit. Yeah, the strong man. Well, actually, I just yeah, don't think man. I realized that strong man was your thinking. I don't really know how that went off base, <laughs> but <laughs> it made it so logical to me that it was your thinking you had to watch. And uh, that include, I, and I just thought you had mentioned in the last roundtable that some of the most difficult strong men to overcome were self-will, self-justification, and self-love. And there we had it in this lesson on obedience <laughs> the next week. And self-justification is one of the worst. That's where you, you have a reason why you did what you did, yeah. and you will fight for that reason. I realized that self-justification was what Martha Wilcox talks about, excuse, excuse-making habit. Yes. That's one of my favorite articles, the definition of intelligence and those few pages on excuses and how deadly those excuses are. Everyone should be familiar. Lawrence, were you going to say something? Yeah, because in all that, all the examples you've given and all this, we are really obeying the opposite laws of God. We are, God, we are allowing these laws to govern us instead of allowing God's spiritual, pure, perfect laws to govern us. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us round robin. Who and what are you obeying? Obedience to God. Follow his rules. If he's, if he's asking you to, to, for these rules, that means you can do it. Man, God has man, made man capable of this, as Eddie says. You are capable to do this, so don't tell yourself you're not. So we're going to end today on Faith Cure, one of my favorite articles, because it tells you what really... What real healing is, it's in retrospection and introspection. Gary will read it. It is often asked, why are faith cures sometimes more speedy than some of the cures wrought through Christian scientists? Because faith is belief and not understanding. And it is easier to believe than to understand spiritual truth. It demands less cross-bearing, self-renunciation, and divine science to admit the claims of the corporeal senses and appeal to God for relief through a humanized conception of his power than to deny these claims and learn the divine way, drinking Jesus' cup, being baptized with his baptism, gaining the end through persecution and purity. Millions are believing in God or good without bearing the fruits of goodness. 
not having reached its science. Belief is virtually blindness when it admits truth without understanding it. Blind belief cannot say with the apostle, I know whom I have believed. There is danger in this mental state called belief. For if truth is admitted but not understood, it may be lost. And error may enter through this same channel of ignorant belief. The faith cure has devout followers whose Christian practice is far in advance of their theory. The work of healing in the science of mind is the most sacred and salutary power which can be wielded. My Christian students, impressed with the true sense of the great work before them, enter this straight and narrow path and work conscientiously. Let us follow the example of Jesus, the master metaphysician, and gain sufficient knowledge of error to destroy it with truth. Evil is not mastered by evil. It can only be overcome with good. This brings out the nothingness of evil and the eternal somethingness, vindicates the divine principle, and improves the race of Adam. It's a powerful article. Make it one of your best friends. It also explains a lot of healing that goes on where there's really no growth spiritually. Christian science demands of us all that we grow spiritually. So, thank you all for joining today. And we will have a powerful service coming up. Thank you. 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 Thank you.